Okay, g'day all. Welcome to another Linux tube. Um, just ignore the fact that I'm clearly in Windows 8. Uh, we'll get to Linux in a virtual box in a minute. Alrighty, so I wanted to go through just a bunch of things before we start coding. So today we're just going to look at a few terms and some really interesting and important concepts in assembly. And um, yeah, let's just get started. So first of all, I want to look at data sizes, just so that we're all on the same page. Uh, a bit is short for a binary digit, and that can be a zero or a one. So that's the very smallest amount of information in a computer. Uh, a byte is a collection of eight bits together, and uh, if you get eight little zeros and ones together, there's 256 different possible permutations. Uh, then we've got a word, which is two bytes together, one after another, or 16 bits together, and that's called a short int in C++. Then we've got a D word, or a long, which is four bytes together, or 32 bits, and that's called a D word in Intel, or a long word in AT&T syntax. And these are the same as int in high-level language. Hmm. Uh, then we've got Q word, or quad word, and these are 64 bits wide, so these are eight bytes all in a line. And you can make really massive numbers with um, Q words. You know, if you want to do maths on really large integers, use a Q word. Okay, so the general syntax to assembly. Uh, assembly is written as a sequence of instructions, each occupying one line. Yeah, you don't tend to do complex maths expressions in brackets like you do in, say, C++ or C Sharp. Uh, you don't make complex expressions from smaller ones in assembly. You tend to just do one little tiny thing per line. That's pretty much how it works. Just one tiny thing per line and you know, from little things, big things grow, you add them all together and uh, you get your computer to do amazing things. So this is what assembly looks like. You've got a mnemonic on a line and that's followed by a comma separated list of parameters. Uh, you can probably see that Intel syntax and AT&T syntax are pretty similar but there are some, some differences um, which we're going to go through, I guess. Yeah, this is the Intel and AT&T versions of exactly the same thing. They're just going to add the value 23 in 6. Hmm. Okay, so source and destination operands is a really important concept as well, especially if you're reading the um, Intel and uh, AMD programmers' manuals. They talk about source and destination a lot. Uh, it does get pretty confusing, though, since uh, the destination is often a source operand as well. Anyway, basically, uh, the source operands are used to perform a calculation, and the destination is where the answer is going to be stored. So if you have something like this, i equals j plus q, uh, you could say that j and q are the source operands, and i is the destination. This is obviously not assembly. This is some other, you know, maybe C++ code or something, but that's the idea. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Okay, so something really interesting about AT&T versus Sin uh, Intel is that the source and destination operands are swapped. Yeah, so most of the time, this is what you'll see. Instead of saying mov EAX 100, where EAX is the destination, and 100 is what you want to move into EAX, uh, in AT&T syntax, you say it the other way around. So mov L, move long, and then $100 and percent %EAX. So the dollar just here in uh, AT&T means that 100 is an immediate value. It's, you know, a literal number. And the percent means that EAX is a register. Yeah, you put percent beside registers and dollars beside immediate values. But the point is, the point is that EAX is the destination. So EAX is where we're moving the value 100, and you see that it's swapped positions in the parameter list. It's quite nice, actually, to read AT&T syntax because it reads much better. This line here reads something like move 100 into EAX, whereas the Intel line, you tend to read something like move into EAX the value 100. Yeah, so AT&T syntax is a little bit clearer in that respect. Alrighty, so mnemonics. Yeah, mnemonics are just an easy way to remember what the instruction does. It's a human readable version of machine code number. Yeah, we don't want to remember machine code, so we remember mnemonics instead. Um, in the Intel syntax, the mnemonics are unadorned, but in AT&T syntax, they have an extra letter which indicates the data size to operate on. Yeah, you might have seen that little L on the side of the uh, mnemonic for the AT&T syntax um, mov of the previous slide, and that means long. Um, we've got B, 
means byte, W means word, or two bytes, uh, L means long, and Q means quad word. Those are the suffixes for AT&T syntax. We'll see a lot more of them. They're pretty easy. Okay, so on to registers. Uh, registers are little tiny bits of, uh, not bits, I shouldn't say bits, they're little, little spaces of memory that reside on the CPU, and they're actually part of the CPU. They're extremely, extremely fast. Extremely fast. Um, compared to RAM, you know, most of the time you tend to think of RAM as being quite fast, but um, the registers are, are about a hundred times faster than um, reading and writing to RAM, so they're extraordinarily fast because they're on the CPU itself. And the CPU reads data from RAM into its registers and it performs calculations with them and then writes the answers back to RAM. Yeah, it doesn't tend to manipulate values in RAM directly. It manipulates these little things called registers and it performs all of its calculations on its registers and it sort of outputs the answers back to RAM so that, you know, it can be displayed on the screen or whatever. Yeah, it might, might seem a little bit strange, but that's how it works. Uh, registers don't have an address. <laughs> yeah, they don't have an address. They're, they're on the CPU. They're not in RAM, so you can't make a pointer to a register. It just doesn't make sense, since um, pointers only point to things in RAM. Uh, they also don't have a data type. Oh, yeah, this is weird. Um, more properly, yeah, more properly they're all data types at once. Yeah, they're very cool anyway. They're one of the coolest things about assembly, to be honest. This is how they work. So the x86 register set. We're talking about x86 registers here. Uh, registers can be used in many different ways. Firstly, let's look at AL. Here's AL. AL is one of the x86 registers, and it's 8 bits wide. Uh, which means it's a byte, so it can be used for signed or sun unsigned arithmetic, it doesn't matter. Um, it's for working with single characters. Yeah. And another register is AH. AH is another 8-bit register, so A high and A low, that's what they're um, both called, and we'll see why in just a second. Because both of them join together to make AX. Yeah, so AH is the high byte of AX, AL is the low byte, uh, hence the H and the L. So AX is a 16-bit register. It's just a variable sitting on the CPU with 16 bits. But if you want, you can use each of its high and low bytes um, completely independently. Alrighty, moving on to 32 bits. So EAX, or extra AX, I believe it's uh, the E is for is a 32-bit version of the AX register and the top 16 bits are just, they're nothing, but the low 16 bits of EAX are the AX register that we just looked at. So the lowest byte of EAX is the AL register that we saw at the very start. Is that interesting or what? They're all over the place. This is a crazy, crazy sort of variable, but this is, yeah, this is registers. Uh, there's no way to directly access the top 16 bits of EAX. Yeah, you can't. You can't directly access the top 16 bits of EAX, but you can directly access the low 16 bits of EAX by using AX. Okay, and finally, here we go, 64-bit version. Uh, the 64-bit version of EAX is uh, called RAX, RAX. Uh, pretty cool name. Um, so EAX is actually the low 32 bits of RAX. If if none of this is making sense, don't worry about it particularly. Uh, all all it really means is that you've got a bunch of variables, and uh, they're all kind of the same thing. So RAX is composed of EAX, which is composed of AX, which is composed of AH, which is composed of AL. You can use you know, the 16-bit, the 8-bit, the 64-bit version, depending on what you want to do. Yeah, so if you're working with 64-bit ints, you use RAX. If you're working with 16-bit integers, then you'd use AX. That's pretty much all it comes down to. Alrighty, there's actually 16 of these. Yeah, AX isn't by itself. There's 16 different registers, um, and they're all collectively called the general purpose registers. Um, they've all got the same abilities as RAX. Yeah, so they've they've each got 64-bit versions, 32-bit, 16-bit versions, and byte versions. 
and collectively they're called GPR, or General Purpose Registers. Although many of them actually have specific roles. Yeah, they're still called GPR. So here they all are, actually. There's RAX right at the very top. And that was originally called the Accumulator. No good reason, I don't think. <laughs> uh, RBX, RCX, and RDX. So I think you can see a pattern in the naming of those first four. That was supposed to be the base, counter, and data registers. Um, I, yeah, so they're all the same. You've got um, EBX, just like you had EAX, that's the 32 bit version. You've got BX, just like you had AX. Uh, you've got B high and B low, which is the um, lowest bytes of the 64 bit RBX register. And RCX and RDX are exactly the same. Uh, RSP is a special register, and we usually don't play with that too much. Uh, this is called the stack pointer for a really good reason. Yeah, RSP is 64-bit version. ESP is um, some sort of mind reading technique, I think. But um, it's also the 32-bit version of this register. SP is the low 16 bits, and SPL is the low 8 bits. So you can't actually access the second from lowest byte in RSP like you can these other registers. Uh, in fact, you can't access the second from lowest byte in any of the other registers, only those first four. And it's generally not recommended either. Yeah. Um, okay, so next we've got RBP, which is the base pointer, and that's the stack pointer's best friend. They're really good friends, base pointer and stack pointer. They reckon that's great. Um, EBP is the 32-bit version, BP, and then BPL is the uh, low version. Alrighty, then we've got RDI, which is a destination index. Uh, source and destination index are used for string operations. But after that, we get um, a bunch of new registers that were just introduced in 64-bit CPUs. So they didn't have these in 32-bit CPUs. These are brand new, just for us. Uh, we've got R7, R8, R9, R10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So they decided after a while that maybe they should start naming their registers something <laughs> logical. So they just put numbers there. Uh, but each of those has a 64-bit, a 32-bit, a 16-bit, and a low 8-bit version as well. So, really, really flexible stuff. Okay, there is a whole bunch of special registers that aren't general purpose. So all those 16 that we just looked at were GPR, or general purpose registers, even though some of them have special, reason, uh, special uses. Uh, these ones that we're looking at on this page are really special. Uh, first of all, probably the most special of them all, the specialist, uh, RIP, RIP. Uh, this is called the instruction pointer. And there's also EIP and, uh, you know, 32-bit versions and, and maybe 16-bit versions, but you don't use the, the instruction pointer the way that you use the other registers, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, but this pointer points to the next spot in RAM where the instructions are being read from. Yeah, so while your application executes, um, the RIP is counting up. It's creeping through the machine code one instruction at a time, uh, grabbing it from RAM and bringing it into the CPU. That's the uh, instruction pointer. I think they call it a uh, program counter in uh, other assembly languages like Motorola. Who cares? Uh, R flags. Yeah, this is another really important and very strange register. This is the flags register. Uh, it maintains flags so that we can check conditions from recent instructions. Yeah, you do a bunch of things, like you add things and you compare different numbers, and the flags register kind of bleeps and, and bips and turns its flags on and off depending on what happened. So you can then use the uh, flags register to, you know, act on uh, certain decisions. It'll make more sense, I think, when we look at the compare instruction, along with jumps. Okay, so the S, and then I've just put brackets here. Uh, there's actually a number goes in there. Uh, this is a little array of uh, registers, which the x87 floating point unit uses. Uh, we don't do a lot of this nowadays. I think that the Microsoft C++ compiler and probably the um, GNU C++ compiler for 64-bit tends to use SSE registers instead. But this is always available as well, so we're probably not going to look at this, but the x87 floating point unit is really, really cool, but extremely strange. It's very strange. Um, 
these registers work like a stack. Yeah, but we're not going to talk about it now. Uh, they're also really big too. They're 80 bits wide, so they're even bigger than a C++ double. Yeah, so if you need extra precision, jump straight to the x87, folks. Yeah, you can't go wrong. Good stuff. And the final registers, the final special registers are the SIMD registers. So there's a bunch of these. Um, yeah, SSE or MMX or AVX, whatever sort of CPU you've got, it might have different SIMD registers. Oh yeah, and there's other ones as well, like debugging and machine or, or CPU specific registers. And things for counting clock ticks and all sorts of performance monitoring registers. Uh, but these are mostly specific to any particular CPU, so we can't really you know, talk about them in a general way. Anyway, that's registers. A few basic instructions here. MOV, ADD, SUB, INC, DEEK. Uh, I think we might just have a bit of a look at some coding. Oh, Locked me out. Alright, I'm going to get back into Nano, just because I like it. Um, okay, so, uh, just a little bit of coding. If you're in... Um, Intel syntax, you're using NASM or something, and you want to move a value into a register, you would do something like, say, AX, you want to move um, 15 into AX, something like that. Uh, that's going to copy the value 15 into AX. If you're in um, AT&T syntax, you would do mov W, or move word, and then $15, so the dollar means that 15 is um, an immediate value, and then percent AX. So that's the AT&T version of the same thing. Uh, if you want to add a value, say you want to add um, maybe RCX to RDX, you would do add RCX RDX in uh, Intel syntax. I might just put here. Um, and if you're in uh, AT&T, you would do add Q, Q for quad word, and percent RDX, and percent RCX. AT&T. Um, yeah, so the operands, the source and destination operands are swapped between the two syntaxes. Uh, you've got these suffixes on the end of AT&T syntax, and you've also got these prefixes to the operands. Uh, another instruction that you can do if you want to subtract values, say you want to subtract um, 12 from the stack pointer, RSP, something like that, and I might just, um, yeah, don't do that <laughs> unless you know what you're doing. Yeah, you will, don't subtract anything from the stack pointer. Uh, we will later, but not now. Anyway, um, the um, AT and T is going to be sub Q and then dollar twelve and percent RSP. That's AT and T. Um, so the second parameter here in Intel syntax gets subtracted from the first, and in AT and T it's the first parameter gets subtracted from the second. And then we've also got ink. Ink is increment or just add one. So we could say something like um, maybe we get CL. Ink CL. Whoops, it only takes one parameter. Uh, that's Intel syntax. Um, so whatever CL was, it's going to have one added to it. So if it, you know it's five, it's going to be six. If it was twelve, it's going to be thirteen. <laughs> Um, okay, so we've also got ink BL and percent CL. So that would be the AT and T syntax. So here's just a few little things that you can do uh, with assembly. Yeah, uh, move add sub ink. Oh, I did want to say deke as well. So deke is decrement. That's the opposite to increment. That subtracts one from a, a register. So um, let's do maybe R9, R9D. Deke R9D. That's going to subtract um, one from the register R9D, and that's Intel syntax. Uh, or we've got what is this? Deke L and percent R9D. 
There we go. So yeah, just a few little instructions there. So if you take the example that we coded up last time and put it into your uh, Nano or whatever you're modifying, uh, you should be able to start playing around with the value that we returned. Yeah, and see if you can do some little sums, like you know, adding 15 and subtracting 15, and using some of the different registers. Uh, do be careful which registers you use. It's probably best to stick to sort of AX and CX and all of these ones that start with um, numbers, so R7, R8, R9, R10, uh, because some of the registers are used for other things. Anyway, that's about all I wanted to say, so thanks for listening. See you later.